as uh, president. And it's happened before. Oftentimes, uh, our presidents come from the academic <coughs> rank. And I think I confuse people, right? Because I work at Georgia Tech, so they think I'm an academic, right? You would think that. Am I an academic? I don't have a PhD. Don't need one, right? <laughs> No, but I uh, had a great career, uh, 22 years at Georgia Power, and then uh, they decided, uh, that was in the 90s when things were changing and the, the people in California came up with a new word called deregulation. If you remember, I studied history and it scared everybody because utilities thought they were going to actually have to earn money rather than just sit back and collect on what they had spent. Well, it sounds like today, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so they donated all their R&D facilities to Georgia Tech, and, and me, me included. So I've been at Georgia Tech since 96. Uh, officially, I am retired. I retired last April from Georgia Tech, so I'd have more time to devote to uh, PES. But at least in Georgia, you can come back uh, as retired but working. So I'm working a little over half, well, less, officially I'm working less than half time. So that there's no lawyers in the room, <laughs> right. but uh, but having fun, and uh, this is a presentation I gave last month to the Atlanta chapter. Uh, they actually came down to our labs at at Forest Park Knee Track, and uh, uh, it, it's hopefully I'll get through it okay. But uh, if there are questions, uh, we can work on that last year. Uh, I guess it was two years, a little two or two and a half years ago. I was at PowerTech at Manchester. And I heard my colleague and friend Wanda Reeder give a presentation there. Anybody know Wanda? She was a PS president in 2006, seven time frame. Was she our first? I think she was our first female president. Awesome lady. I knew her back when she worked at Northern States Power. So we go way back. But she gave a presentation and the, the gist was everything's changing. The way we make it, the way we move it, and the way we use it. You get that? Coal plants are coming down. Uh, I was sitting at the kitchen table back two years ago, one, one Saturday morning, and the ground shook. It was a stack at Plant Yates coming down. It's 20 miles away, but it <laughs> shook the ground 20 miles away. Uh, I know Southern's taking them down. I'm sure the nice folks over here are taking them down. It doesn't make sense anymore. Solar farms. You know what they are selling energy out of solar farms for? Have you heard the numbers? Less than three cents a kilowatt hour? Some of those large contracts? Wow, the way we make it is definitely changing. The way we move it. I want to give you a presentation on one of the ways it's going to change on the way we move it. The way we use it. What's changing there? I put in some LED lights this weekend, <laughs> right? Cars. Cars. My, I was going to turn over 100,000 miles on my leaf tomorrow. It's 99.999. .999. So tomorrow, I'm going to post it on Facebook and LinkedIn, my leaf on the second 100,000 miles. Trouble free, right? But all the manufacturers have an EV on the streets are coming and they're much better than my original 2012 LEAF. Okay, I want to put one more out there of the everything's changing. And this one is really something I know nothing about, so I'm not going to speak about it, but the way we sell it. Have you heard of blockchain? Have you heard of community microgrids where you're going to be sharing those resources and uh, we're working on stuff at Georgia Tech to try to make that work with real-time pricing based upon what frequency droop the old-fashioned way no some of the newer stuff so everything's changing so what a great time to be entering the industry like some of us are not going to be here long, long enough to see it all through but you are so uh, and we need you and we need your uh, capabilities, talents, and I'm going to show you an example of some of the, the neat things that we're working on at Georgia Tech. Uh, and I was very impressed with the Clemson Labs over at Charleston last fall when we went over for eGrid. And we're going to be using the hardware in the loop test set for a project for, for one of our members soon, hopefully, on uh, power electronic transformers. 
that we can't do at NETRAC. We're set up more for the traditional transmission and distribution stuff. So here's a presentation I'll share with you about change. Typically, uh, the way we did it when I was a student, that was when nuclear plants were really catching on. And, and the catchphrase back in the 70s was, electricity is going to be too cheap to meter. You remember that? That was, that was it, yeah, too cheap to meter. Didn't happen. <laughs> Didn't happen. So large central station, transmission network, substations, medium voltage distribution, radio out to the customer. That's what the U.S. grid is. But that's changing. Like I say, the plants are coming down. Those new solar farms are not in the same place and they're not the size. So the way we move it is going to be different. So let's click the slides and get started. I'll start with uh, NETRAC and Smart Wires collaboration. Then we're going to talk about power flow control. I'm sure that's in one of your courses here, right? Yeah? Okay. Somewhere. And third, we'll wrap up with uh, how they're actually using this technology all over the world. Started here with IP that Deepak Devon, which I'll get into, brought to Georgia Tech. All right, a little bit about NETRAC. Is that, is that you, Randy, in, in the background? Uh, I hope not. I hope not, no. <laughs> uh, this is obviously a demo shot, uh, but we do have uh, lightning impulse, uh, high voltage AC, high current AC, but we don't have high power. So it's high voltage, high current, not high power. And here's uh, the areas we typically focus in. And uh, Teddy had a pretty good brainstorm there when uh, Georgia Power came to Southern or Georgia, uh, when Georgia Power came to Georgia Tech and said, would you like a laboratory? <laughs> uh, Teddy said, sure. And uh, he put together 10 original members uh, that said, yeah, we'll come together and work together and uh, use this laboratory. And uh, these were all the things that uh, we decided to focus on. So NETRAC works with both utilities and manufacturers to do things in the T&D space of interest. And of course, we, Georgia Tech, as a neutral party, try to facilitate that and make that happen. And one of the things on our list was power flow control. So next slide. Uh, here's a poster of our current members, 2018-19. Uh, so we're up to 37. And... Uh, a lot of the utilities are pretty big, like Duke. Duke keeps buying everybody. Uh, well, Dominion just bought <laughs> South Carolina Electric. We keep losing members because they buy each other. They buy each other. But uh, we still have a... Membership fee when they do that. Though. Well, we're talking about... <laughs> we're talking about that. But uh, we do have a fairly uh, substantial part of the U.S. as far as uh, members, both in utilities and manufacturers. This... Uh, let me say this about EPRI. I, I've been an EPRI advisor before when I was at Georgia Power. EPRI is a great institution. You get a chance to go to work for them. They're, they're great. Uh, they are an institution for research for utilities. They don't have manufacturers as members. Our membership model has both utilities and manufacturers equals working together on projects of common interest. So that's, that's the best way I can describe the difference between NETRAC. Oh, one other thing. They're huge. We're just little. <laughs> yeah, so don't, don't get worried, but uh, you can see our, our member list there. All right, next slide. A little bit, one slide about smart wires. Uh, they are growing like uh, gangbusters. Uh, they started out, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you the history of, of smart wires in the slides themselves, but uh, they got offices, uh, Australia, uh, Ireland, uh, the U.S. They manufacturing center is in Wilmington, North Carolina. They've got a contract manufacturer there, and uh, I think they have been burning through huge wads of money getting to where they are. But uh, word is they're about to actually make money. Takes a while, right? We're engineers. We don't know about the business cycle, but it takes a lot of money to to gear up infrastructure like that around the world. All right, let's go. All right, the collaboration piece, NETRAC, smart wires. Next. So, wow. Is there not a year banner on the top? Wow. Your computer cut it off. Oh, yeah. Is that just a projector? Okay, it's there now. Okay. 
George, uh, anybody know Deepak Devon, my colleague? Randy does. He's a power electronics guy, great guy. He came to Georgia Tech in 2004, and uh, that's the first time I met him, and he had this thing called smart wires. That's interesting. What you want to do, you want to put something around a transmission conductor? Utilities aren't going to let you do that. I told him he was kind of crazy. But here's a picture of the first device that uh, actually he made that at Soft Switching Technologies, which uh, was his startup that he uh, did when he was at Wisconsin. So, uh, but we brought that one down to Georgia Tech and then we developed uh, a prototype of it, which I'll show you. But it's a pretty simple concept, right? Most of the good stuff that you can invent is simple. That's what I've seen. If it's complicated, no. It's got to be simple. So here's the uh, transmission conductor. You have a coaxial transformer and you uh, use that coaxial transformer to inject current into the line, either for or against the line current. So you can actually change the impedance of the conductor with this device. It's self-powered off the transmission conductor so you don't have to you know, power it. Uh, you can even add communications and controls to it or make it Make it as simple as you want or as complicated as you want. And as we get through the presentation, you can see what it started with and where it is today. Okay, next slide. And for those that were in 3600, 3, the class right before this one, yeah. we were just talking about current transformers today. Okay. Right? That, so did you notice the resemblance of that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. We lost the years, but I'll try to remember them. Uh, okay, back up one. There we go. It takes twice and it likes it better there. This is the first prototype that we built together with DPAC, working together with DPAC. We made a long coaxial transformer. And uh, the beauty of this was uh, it's simple. We tried to start simple. Let's leave the power electronics out of this. Uh, let's start simple. So it's a single turn coaxial transformer. The transmission conductor is a single turn and they're the secondary. And uh, if you open the switch, M right there. If you open that switch, open circuit the secondary of that coaxial transformer, you insert the leakage inductance of that coaxial transformer into the conductor. So you basically adding inductance to the line. So is that going to do you any good? Depends on whether, if it's a radio line, no, it's not going to do you. If it's a network line, yes, we'll show you how it works. Okay, so it's a simple circuit, coaxial transformer, open switch. M, you insert inductance, you close switch M, you take it back out of the circuit. It's also self-powered off the line. And you see the uh, thigh wrist repair. Uh, switches are not quick enough to close if there's a fault condition, but thigh wristers are. So you have to sense if there's a fault on the line, be able to close the thigh wrist repair across that open circuit switch, or else you're going to have a big fireball <laughs> up there on the line, right? So that's what all that's about. And you could have that programmed at a threshold limit, say when the current gets up to 1,000 amps, uh, the switch opens and inserts its inductance in the line. It's not a lot, so it takes a lot of them to do the job. Here's the first one we built. Here's the uh, enclosure we built. We uh, tested it in the high voltage lab for Corona, so we wanted to kind of do a, a good job with that. That was in like 2008. We actually demoed this at one of our NETRAC management board meetings at the laboratory. And uh, there were some people interested. Next slide. These people, NRECA, Southern, TVA, Baltimore, and us. So we put together a core group of utilities, worked together and said, okay, if we had this, what would it look like? What, would, what performance specifications would you like for it to meet? because we're going to put it around a transmission conductor and it's got to live through everything out there. Lightning, over voltages, wind, rain, vibration, all that kind of stuff. So one of the guys uh, actually from our members to say, hey, I'd like to take that and run with it as a company, Woody Gibson. And uh, he started a company and uh, got up some initial capital and Smart Wires was formed like in 2010 as a company. This core group continued to work together with us to refine things. Next slide. And the first prototype came out ready uh, that would go up in a real line, 
We'll talk about that. Here's the first one that was made, and this is at the Neatrack Labs in uh, Chicago. Now, why would a Neatrack Lab be in Chicago? Because we don't have a high power uh, lab at, at Forest Park, so we have an agreement with SNC Electric to use their laboratory, and we have our own control room and so forth. <laughs> Can you imagine what the utilities wanted that uh, device to survive as far as fault current? Any guesses? 63,000 amps for 30 s cycles, not seconds, cycles. Yeah, 30 th uh, 63 kA for 30 cycles. So we did those initial tests at, uh, at S&C. Uh, and we learned a lot. And it actually did pass. It actually did pass. We had to work on the test technique, but it did pass. Okay, the next slide. Guess who won the contest for the first pilot installation? You know those people? TVA. Yeah. I just happened to be giving this same presentation next Thursday in Chattanooga. <laughs> yeah, but TVA, uh, they had actually funded Deepak early on. And... Uh, they kind of won the contest because Southern really wanted to be first, but they lost out. TVA won, and uh, there's it's on a 138 kV line near Knoxville. We were up there in the fall of 2012. Beautiful fall day. They had crews came in special to put them up, and uh, they got them on the line and tested them out for us, and liked them. And liked them. Uh, next slide. Okay, we missed, we back up one. <laughs> Southern is over here in the corner. We didn't forget them, they waited till the spring of uh, 2013, I guess. There's a pilot uh, that was installed on a 115 kV line in Atlanta. So you have to kind of make all your sponsors happy. That's, that's most of the battle, right, with university stuff. Making sure all your funders are happy. Yes, so Southern did get one, but they weren't first. TVA was first. Okay, keep going. Uh, worked together with our friends at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric to figure out how to install them uh, using a helicopter because depending upon the line terrain, uh, you know, moving bucket trucks from structure to structure could be so. The, uh, the TVA pilot, it was a 15 mile line and there were 33 units per phase, so 99 units had to be put up. So once again, this is one of the deficiencies of the first prototype. They were small, okay? We'll see if we've addressed that. Keep going. And uh, they came up with the idea of, okay, let's put a little more bang for the buck, right? So while, you know, the first generation, very simple, straightforward, you couldn't inject much impedance. So they came up with the idea of a smart valve and actually use a little power electronics and coupling transformers inside to make a compact device to have more impact on both adding inductance to the line and taking it away. So you'll see as we go forward that this power, the initial adding impedance concept changed to both plus minus power flow control. So we worked with Smart Valve in uh, 2015, also back at uh, SNC in in Chicago, and that one also survived 63 kA for 30 cycles. So that's an important milestone. So you gotta make sure that protection circuit is really good. Okay, next slide. So here's kind of, uh, if any of you are entrepreneurs, this is how long it could take. Uh, Deepak filed the patent, gosh, while well, he was at Soft Switch in like 2001. When he came to Georgia Tech, uh, one of the things that we asked him was to sign that patent over to Georgia Tech, which he did. So it's a Georgia Tech IP now. And uh, here you saw this. You got to have a group of potential customers to kind of help you develop the product, make sure it's going to work for them, you know, make sure it's meeting their applications and meeting all of their safety issues and, and criteria. Next slide. And uh, we got it out. We got some of our members actually using it with Pacific Gas Electric. And they call that the first commercial install. I'm sure PG&E paid, paid for it. But, uh, you know, they also helped to develop the installation technique using uh, California dollars to, uh, as a research project to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Next slide. 
And then we said, okay, that's, uh, that's great, but it's, you got to put up a lot of them. So we came up with the smart valve concept and uh, worked with a commercialization with Eargrid over in Ireland. And they actually put one up on their line in 2016. Next. And uh, it's catching on in the UK. UK system is different than the US system, right? Uh, somewhat different. Somewhat different. So they were very interested. I'll show you a use case from UK Power Networks. Next slide. And then most recently, they were doing a smart valve install for Central Hudson up in New York. So catching on around the world. And uh, their most recent idea is putting the smart valves in trailers for uh, temporary installation. And we'll talk about that use case as well. Since they're now, you can put a lot of bang for the buck in a mobile unit. Maybe there's a place for that. So it's kind of grown from that initial unit that uh, Deepak brought to us. Next. So let's talk a little bit about the technology. Uh, next slide. Let's start with a very simple case. You have the, the generation centers and you have the load centers. And say this particular case, there's three paths to get from generation to load. Three different transmission lines involved. And based upon how the loads build up on the grid, one line always loads up before the others. <coughs> Right? That's just one of the natural principles. And the first one that overloads limits your power throughput to that transmission network to that load center. And uh, say that top line hit 105% and that should have come up in their planning studies 10 years ahead of time, but probably done. It <laughs> kind of sneaks up on them sometimes. So what, you, what are you faced with then as a utility? Back up one. Yeah, I don't want to give them all the answers, right? This is going to be on the quiz. Yeah, yeah. So, if you were a planning engineer, what do you do? You generate a project request to add another line, build a line. Oh, then you got to buy right away. That's at least 10 years, right? Buying right away. It, and there are a lot of lawyers involved, so that's not a good solution. Uh, you can reconductor, so you have to do a proposal, project proposal, come up with that to reconductor lines. And that could take a couple of years in the planning cycle, get approved in the budget and carried out. So it's not a quick fix. That's why you have to really watch the loads as they develop and plan ahead. Uh, or else you're going to be making people unhappy over there when you uh, actually uh, start uh, reducing demand by turning people off like they do in Haiti and other places around the world. Okay, so that was before smart wires. So with our original concept of the Guardian, just adding impedance in the line, uh, you could actually put li uh, Guardians on the top line, and when they turn on, it limits the power flow through that top line to 99%. So where'd the rest of the power go? To the other two lines, right? So it, as the impedance of this line goes up, it shifts over to those lines. It makes it a happy camper. Uh, the load's happy. Everybody's happy, and you don't have to go out and reconduct to the line or build another transmission line. One more slide. With the new technology, uh, you can still do guardians on this line to limit it, but you could actually put smart valves on the underloaded line and decrease the impedance of that line and actually suck power. That's, that's a technical term, right? Power doesn't, no, don't go there. Uh, suck power into that bottom line and really increase the power flow. So therefore, the smart valve, really technology-wise, is a, is a great fit for a, lot of, for a lot of places. Why would we need that now? What did we start off with? Everything's changing. The transmission lines were built from those generating plants to those load centers. That's what utilities did. The plants are not going to be there anymore. The load centers are going to stay. Where is the generation going to be coming from? Someplace else. Solar farms, wind farms, uh, combined cycle units. You know, it's not going to be conventional coal for sure. And hopefully the nuclear is going to hang in there for a few more years. Okay, next slide. So this is kind of a recap uh, with our uh, focus group. We developed specs for, you know, 
all of the things that uh, the Guardians have to survive, mechanical and electrical, corrosion, slip, all of that. And that was necessary to get utilities even to agree to put them up. Uh, so we got that box checked. Next slide. And uh, this is kind of where it came from, the Powerline Guardian, with just as a push technology. And they talked about, well, you can put them on both ends of the span. You could actually have a short span and just fill that sucker up with Guardians to increase the numbers to bump the impedance up. That, that didn't sell well with utilities. They said, no, we're not going to do that. So uh, they moved to a, how you say, more powerful Guardian that's big and heavy and it's got a transformer inside. That's the secret of it. That's why you get more impedance injection. But these would have to be hung from towers or you could put them out in a, a substation hanging them up. So that was kind of an intermediate, but this is where they are now. Does this look smaller? Does this look lighter? A lot smaller, a lot lighter, and a lot more bang for the buck. The smart valve. Push, pull, push, pull. And uh, we'll show you a, a picture of it so you can see the magic inside a little bit later. And uh, that's what's in the trailer. Okay, next. And uh, we mentioned our work helping them to develop it. And, and uh, when you talk to the power electronics guys and you say you want it to withstand 63KA for 30 cycles they, after, they <laughs> after they get up off the floor. And, yeah. So uh, that's one of the secrets is how do you protect the device for faults. And transmission lines do have faults. They do. And it's got to survive those. Okay, next slide. So here's the secret sauce inside. They have two series right now. I don't think any of you are potential customers, so this is not a commercial. <laughs> this is not a commercial for smart uh, valve, but uh, depending upon your application, uh, they have a series 1000 and a series 2000, and the series 1000 talks about it can inject up to a thousand kVar of reactive power. The series 2000 can inject up to 2000 kVar per unit. Okay. And the other number in the model number, like the series uh, 1000-1800, the 1800 is the maximum current that that device is intended for. So 1800 amp line, 1000 kVar. So uh, their device, if you want to look it up in the Power Electronics book, is a modular static synchronous series compensator. Uh, full disclosure, when I was a student at Georgia Tech, I had a class in vacuum tubes. <laughs> so that was power electronics to us. So uh, I'm not the power electronics person, I'm the old utility guy. But uh, once again, this device can inject a voltage either leading or lagging in quadrature to what it's seeing on the line based upon a algorithm that's stored in the unit or a lot of these now are going real time into the SCADA EMS network. So the operator can control those devices uh, and work together. And uh, it's a great product uh, and kind of ready for the market. And, you know, back in 2009, if we'd have known then what we know now, maybe the development would have been accelerated because now this is you know, the right product for the right time because utilities are struggling with this as, uh, as conditions are changing so fast. Uh, next slide. So here's what's inside the box. That's what everybody was, this is what's on the quiz, right? Yeah. So uh, you see the, the power electronics piece, not really complicated, is it? Not at all. A lot of the secret sauce is in uh, how do you put it all together, control it, and protect it. And once again, that protection circuit uh, to make sure that that smart bypass, so very quick bypass circuit in case a, a transient current comes along. But it kind of gives you a picture over on the right of uh, a typical operating range for the model 203600. So it can go up to 3600 amps. Is that a lot for a transmission line? Some, some go more, yeah. But for a single conductor one, yeah, that's probably pretty high. And it can inject up to 2.83 ohms, uh, I mean, excuse me, of reactants plus minus. And uh, that shows you the current as well. So it kind of maps current with impedance injection. So it's not rocket science, but it just happens that 
you know, Deepak came up with a great idea early on and got it all under the patent and SmartWires has taken it to the point of a product and uh, the product is now going forth. Next line. So how are people using it? That's really what you want to know, right? So first one, click, <coughs> click, okay, there you go. This is kind of the conventional thing. Okay, let's increase our network utilization. That's kind of like that first picture where you get one line overloads first and you'd like to prevent that. You know, you want to use those underloaded lines. That's been an issue forever. And the way utilities have addressed it is either reconductoring or building another line. Pretty simple. Both are expensive. Both take a long time. So it's a great solution for that one. Next one. Okay. Things change, right? The loads in the grid change. Uh, as customers come and go, new loads come, and it, the, the power flow in the grid changes. One of the advantages this device has is if the conditions change, these are fairly small, they can be redeployed. So it's not like a stranded asset. If you built a line, it's there. If it's no longer needed, it's still there. <laughs> uh, so. And if you reconductor a line and it's not doing you any good, that is sunk cost. With this, you can move it around and even make it mobile. If you have a temporary condition like a storm that took things down, if you want to put the grid back together and you need to have some extra impedance in the grid, you could bring that mobile trailer out there and put the unit up. Next one, outages. Oftentimes, <coughs> utilities have to get lines out for scheduled maintenance for for plants or lines, and if the power flow that the planners come up with say that that's going to put this line in danger, you could deploy these devices typically for a two or three week period for an outage for a plan or something. So it could be used for that. These guys were, you know, they helped with the presentation. They wanted to make sure everybody could uh, come up with a way to use their product. Next one. Okay, strategic assets, and that's uh, that's a nice way to put it. But, uh, you know, utilities, the traditional model, you know how utility accounting works? Okay, they go out, they, they buy stuff, they put it on the network, and then they put it in their capital database. And the way the present model works for utilities, they earn based upon what they spent. That's a pretty good deal, right? If you spend a lot of money, you make a lot of money. <laughs> but that's why your rates are there. The Public Service Commission looks at the capital and they allow a certain rate of return on what utilities have invested. Uh, with these, you invest in them, but if they're no longer needed here, you need them there, you pick them up, you move them over here. So it's uh, kind of a strategic asset. Next one, uh, and probably looking into the future, one of the most uh, important issues when you have to regulate power flows in your grid, now let's, let's say that solar farms are coming, most of them are being connected on medium voltage, the smaller ones are. And medium voltage lines historically are radial, not in the UK, but 